If you had to describe Christianity using just one word, what would that one word be? Thank you for joining us for worship here at Calvary Baptist. And if you're a visitor with us, we give you a special welcome. And we thank Michael and Jackie who are helping in our worship today. And thank you for joining us and let's worship. Good morning and welcome to this uh, Trinity Sunday. We'll open up with uh, some verses from Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. On this Trinity Sunday, let us together affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray together at the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory for ever and ever amen and amen Thank you, Jackie. You know, in this part of the worship, we would normally sing a couple songs or a hymn. Well, not, uh, not this time, of course, but there are the songs and hymns a playlist, and so you can still sing along, and so please watch out for that playlist. Um, the songs and hymns that really every Sunday are chosen to really reflect and fit in with the, um, well, they're really the ones that we would sing if, if we were here, uh, in most cases, except when they're very difficult to sing. But anyway, um, there's watch for that playlist. Another thing that we haven't done in a long time actually is, well, it's been well over a year since I've, I've passed around one of these, uh, an offering plate. Nevertheless, you have been generous. And so thank you for your worship through giving. And um, some of you have done that online. Some of you have brought it, uh, brought your worship through giving to the, uh, to the church here. Others have used mail, whatever means. We just, God bless you and your giving, thank you. And now, thank you to Michael, who's going to bring us the, our scripture focus. Thank you, Michael. Good morning. Today's reading is from 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 to 24 in the New International Version. For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. 
Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This is how we know that we are being belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command to believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. If you were to pick just one word to represent Christianity, what would it be? Just one word to convey the essence of Christianity. What word comes to your mind? For some people, the word might be heaven, as in Christianity is about how we get to heaven. For others, the word might be law, as in Christianity helps us know how to live. It gives us the rules on how to live. For others, uh, the word might be tradition, as in Christianity is a, a great tradition uh, for society, and for all of society would, be, would benefit uh, from the Christian tradition. Uh, for others, the word might be theology, that Christianity is all about learning the right things about God. For others, the word that might come to mind might be politics, as in, as a Christian, you learn how to vote. You, uh, and some people would say, as a Christian, you're going to vote this way and not that. Um, so for some people, it might be politics. And for others, the word might be belief. In other words, it's all about just, just believe in Jesus and all the rest will work, its, work itself out. Just believe in Jesus, that's all you need to do. Um, so what word might come to your mind? Well, for John, there's one word that he uses a lot. And if you've joined me on the Pastor's Bible Reading Challenge of reading through the book of First John, uh, every week and at least once, uh, the entire book in one sitting, it's not very long. If you've done that, then you probably know the word because it shows up a lot. And it's a word that would have been important back in John's day for him to speak to the early Christian communities he's speaking to as they face uh, false teachers. They have these false teachers bringing in this false teaching and this one word would be important to them uh, because of those false teachers but we face all kinds of teaching in our day. So actually that one word becomes important in our day too. So let's take a look at that word. And, uh, but before we get to that one word that John uses, let's try and think of the word that the false teachers might use. And we've been thinking about these false teachers in the past few weeks, and we've already seen how basically they're, uh, they're taking the facts about Jesus and changing them to fit the way they're already thinking. They're changing the facts about Jesus in order to fit their way of thinking instead of changing their thinking to fit the facts about Jesus. So they're really messing with the identity of Jesus. But the other thing they're doing along with that is changing what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. Now, what were these early Christian, well, these early false teachers teaching? What were they believing and what was false about it? Well, biblical scholars tend to think that, um, that this is an early form of what later became known as Gnosticism. And basically the idea is that anything spiritual is good, anything material is bad. And so the whole goal of life is actually to, uh, and through learning the right things, 
through knowledge. Uh, that's, that's why it's called Gnosticism, uh, through gaining knowledge, that you can be released from the material body and enter into the spirit world. It's all about becoming uh, and just ditching the material world and just becoming a spirit along with other spirits. And so basically, if you were to sum it up in one word, it would be the word escape. That Gnosticism is really all about escape, escape from this world, escape from this material, physical body that we're in, this material, physical world that we're in. The word is escape. Oh, and by the way, as you're on your way to that escape, because material doesn't matter, it doesn't really matter what you do. So do as you like and anything goes when it comes to ethics. Now to this, John says, uh, no, that's not it. It's not anything goes and the word isn't escape. But there's another word rather that should describe us. And so let's take a look at it in uh, chapter two here, verse chapter three, sorry, verse 11. For this is the message you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. There it is. You've maybe already guessed it. Love is a word that John uses so much in this letter. And it's a word that the early Christians needed to hear. It's a word that we need to hear a lot too. Love. And notice how he says that it's, it's, it's the message they heard from the beginning. In other words, the apostles weren't going around saying, Jesus died for the forgiveness of sins and he is risen and he is Lord. And months later, we'll teach you about love. No, it's right from the beginning. As you learn about Jesus, his death and resurrection, as you learn that he is Lord and Savior, also you learn about becoming a person of love. It's right from the beginning. It's not something tacked on later as oh, this is something that, that doesn't matter as much. No, it matters incredibly. Uh, from the beginning, love. We love one another. Uh, he goes on to describe what this does not look like when he says in verse 12, we must not be like Cain, who was born from the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. In other words, you see here in Cain, uh, exhibit A of what love does not look like. Cain instead hated his brother. Why? Because while well, he was jealous and, and being self-centered, uh, you know, if he was other-centered, if he cared, if he loved his brother, he maybe would have learned from his brother, but instead he just kills him. Uh, so that's an example of what love does not look like. And, and so there's an example there, but John goes on to speak more about love in verse 14. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love one another. Whoever does not love abides in death. In other words, it's kind of a simple test. Are you more like Cain? Or, as we're going to look in a minute, are you more like Jesus? Uh, what's your first thought if you were in Cain's situation? Would it be to kill your brother? Or would it be something different? Um, so those who've experienced Jesus in their lives and the love of Jesus, um, they're, not going to, they're not going to act like Cain. Uh, so let, let's go on and think about, uh, about Jesus then. All who hate a brother or sister are murderers, and you know that murderers do not have eternal life abiding in them. This, that's verse 15. And does that remind you of anything? Well, it should remind us actually of the teaching of Jesus. When Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said this, you've heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. Uh, in other words, there's a rule that you do not kill someone, uh, that you do not murder them. But Jesus goes on to say, but I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. Uh, so it's not just about murdering, it's also about not hating in the first place. Uh, again, it's love is the far better thing to do and he'll go on to teach about loving even your enemies um, and, and loving those who do harm to you even. And so it's all, so it's all about love here that Jesus is contrasted to Cain. And that is carried on even further in verse 16. So we have echoes of the teaching in Jesus in verse 15. Let's look to verse 16. We know love by this, that he, that is Jesus, laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. Again, there's a contrast being drawn there between Jesus, who is the life giver, and Cain, who is the life taker. 
We have Cain who takes his brother's life. We have Jesus who actually lays down his own life, actually for his enemies. What a contrast between them. And as Christ followers then, obviously we're not to follow the way of Cain, but we are to follow the way of Jesus in the path of love. Again, thinking of the teaching of pick up your cross and follow me. That means following in that path of love. And he goes on in verse 17. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? Little children, let us not let us love not in word or speech, but in truth and in action. In other words, as we experience the love of God, that God knows our need, he has supplied our need through Jesus Christ. He has had compassion upon us. Since we have experienced the compassion of God upon us, therefore we now want to have compassion on others and help others where we see there are needs, uh, especially when we have the means to do so and the opportunity. So that compassion of God, that love of God uh, that we see and experience, we, we, as we are filled with the love of God, we want that to pour out to others and we become a compassionate people towards others. And so to summarize here this, this idea, John is using this word a love a lot because again, the false teachers, if they were to pick one word, it'd be all about escape. But for John, it's about love. And he's saying to them, you can't just go changing who Jesus is. You know, again, they're changing the facts about Jesus to fit their way of thinking. But go back to the facts about Jesus, the incarnation of God, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, again, Gnostic thinkers don't even like that idea because material is bad, spirit is good. So why would God become flesh? That would be an evil thing for God to do. Uh, but no, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The incarnation, that is an expression of God's love. Uh, the teaching of Jesus, but then also the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus, which again was a bodily resurrection, a different kind of body, but he certainly was no ghost, no just spirit. He was bodily raised uh, to life. And so again, the Gnostic thinkers, they wouldn't like those facts about Jesus. They'll change those facts about Jesus to, to to fit their way of thinking. Instead of changing their way of thinking to fit the facts about Jesus and the facts about Jesus from beginning to end speak about God's love for us. God came to us in Jesus to express his love for us. And so there's love as being, is a huge part of the essence of who Jesus is and how he died for the forgiveness of our sins and raised to life and he is Lord and his his plan for the, for the world, for the salvation of people. It's, it's all about love. So John's saying to the, uh, uh, to the early Christians here, watch out for the false teachers. They don't get that. Uh, they're all about escape. It's not escape. It's about love. But also the ethics, uh, the way that we now follow Jesus. The false teachers, they're like, well, it doesn't matter what happens in the material world. And John is like, no, it does matter. It's all about love that we follow Jesus in the way of love. We pick up our cross and follow in the way of love. And so that word love became very important for, for John in this letter as he's helping these Christians to say no to these false teachers. Now, how's that going to help us in our day as we are thinking of, of teach, all kinds of teachings that we hear? And not even necessarily false teachings, but maybe sometimes things get emphasized to the exclusion of others and that might be a false way of thinking of things. So let's think through some of them and let's go back to the words that we thought of in the beginning. Uh, for example, heaven. If, you're, if our faith is all about how do we get to heaven and that's it, that's all we're concerned about, then we're missing something very important and that is about love. Now we might talk about God's love for us and how it's because of God's love for us that we get to heaven, but we're missing out on what it means for us to live as Jesus following people. We're, we're missing out on the Lord's prayer, which is, says, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we're missing out on how we, as becoming a people of love, are really part of the answer to that prayer of, of his kingdom purposes being worked out in our world 
And yes, we'll die someday and we'll, we'll be with the Lord and we'll be raised to eternal life bodily someday. There's all of that ahead. But even so, we're missing something if we make our Christianity all about the future and not at all about the now, the here and now. Uh, no, the Lord's Prayer was very much focused on the here and now. Thy kingdom come now, thy will be done on earth now as it is in heaven. And so we want to be a people who are responding to God's love by becoming a people of love. And uh, when you think about it, if we make Christianity just about how do I get to heaven when I die, that can actually get kind of selfish because it's all about me. What do I get out of it? Um, how do I get to heaven? Uh, forget anybody else. That's not Christianity. Um, that's not following Jesus. Uh, following Jesus is how do I have a relationship with God now and through to eternity? But also, how does that affect me now? How am I God's ambassador in the world now? Uh, how does this change things for the people around me? And so it's, it's about more than just me. It's about loving others. Uh, just as God in, emptied himself and came to us in, in Jesus Christ, so we want to discover how we can serve others. So that's, that's one thing, when there's an overemphasis on just how do we get to heaven when we die. Uh, no, we are to be a, become a people of love. What about those who would uh, really focus in on the law and on the rules and how to live properly? Well, we can follow the rules and yet fail to become a person of love. And we don't want to do that. We're called to be a people of love uh, constantly. And, and Jesus has a lot to say, actually, in the Sermon on the Mount and elsewhere about how you can follow the rules and yet miss out on a godly character. The Sermon on the Mount is really a lot of it is about our character. And so he's got a lot to say there about, uh, uh, about you know, you can concentrate on the rules about thou shalt not murder, but I'm saying to you, don't even hate a brother or sister. Watch your heart. Are you loving them? And he goes on to teach about uh, loving your enemies, uh, just as God loves us and loves his enemies. Uh, so using God as an example of love there. So uh, we, we can follow the rules and yet not become a person of love. So love, again, needs to be an important word to us. What about tradition and saying that Christianity is a great tradition for society? Well, again, people can follow traditions and yet not become people of love. And so that would miss the mark also if there's no love in it. Uh, what about theology and learning the right things about God? Well, again, you can learn all the right things about God, but if you're not becoming a person of love, then something is, is missing very much. And um, so, yes, learning about God is so important, and that's why we, that's why we have sermons and whatnot, but also the sermons aren't just about learning about God, but also to learn how now to live as followers of Jesus Christ. Uh, so, and love is a huge part of it. The word love needs to be uh, there a lot. Uh, so there's theology. There's also politics. What about those who make Christianity all about politics, about voting for this candidate and not that? And of course, others will say, well, if you're a good Christian, you'll vote for that, car that candidate and not this. Um, so, yeah, how do we navigate all that? And does Jesus ever speak to politics? Well, kind of. Uh, in John chapter 13, when, when uh, as John says, he, uh, he, he loved them to the end, and what does Je Jesus do next? But um, washes the feet of the disciples. And then he says to them, you call me Lord and Master, and rightfully so, because I am. Yet I have washed your feet, so you do likewise. You do the same kinds of things. Uh, if, and he speaks a lot about if you want to be great in the kingdom, you have to become the least. You have to serve one another. You have to be willing to serve. And so politics, we often think about politics as about power and influence. And Jesus speaks to that saying, well, actually, it's about taking care of people. It's about serving. It's about love. Again, love is a huge word here, an important word. What about the final one, belief and does love need to be a part of that? Well, yeah, actually. And let's take a look at uh, what John says a little later in our scripture focus today. He says, and this is his commandment that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. And so that's so important. Yes, to trust in Jesus. And again, in the identity of Jesus, who he is, an expression of God's love. So the word love, even there is, 
even in just believing and trusting in Jesus, love is a huge part of that. Uh, God's love for us. And then we learn to love God. And, uh, but John can't help himself here. He just talks about uh, believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. He can't help himself but to add that in. Um, that the two go together. It's not trust in Jesus and maybe someday you'll learn something about love, but it's trust in Jesus and love one another. They go together. They, they go together. As you experience God's love, so you become a person of love. Now, I did ask in the beginning for us to think about one word that would describe the essence of Christianity. Really, that's an unfair question. There shouldn't just be one word. There are many words that we can use to describe Christianity. But it's an interesting exercise to think about just one. And let's go to the Apostle Paul. Let's just finish off with the Apostle Paul, who, um, who chose three words, really. And let's take a look at those three words. I think they might sound familiar to you uh, if you've been around Calvary for very long. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. And the greatest of these is love. Who knew? Let us take some time for prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for your, your love for us as our Heavenly Father. Thank you for your love that we should be called children of God. Thank you for your love expressed through Jesus, our Lord and Savior, that he should lay down his life for us, that we may live in him and in you. Thank you, Lord, for your love expressed through your Holy Spirit, that though we had been far from you, yet you have drawn close to us through your Spirit, and that you've even made your home within us. Lord, may we be growing in love for you. You are Heavenly Father. May we be learning to love like your Son, Jesus, ready to pick up a cross and follow in that way of love, in that way of love, grace, and mercy. And Lord, may we be growing in love through the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for your work in us. And Lord, may we have the same love for the people of this world as, as you do, as the Father from whom every family in heaven on earth takes its name. And Lord, may we treat others with the same compassion as Jesus. And may we participate with your Holy Spirit in what you are doing in and for the people around us and in our world. Lord, be with those of our church family and among our families and friends that are facing challenges. Be with those who are feeling the weight of loss and anxiety in these strange days of pandemic. And Lord, help us to be understanding of others, even when we struggle to understand Help us to trust you, Lord, even when we don't fully understand you and what you do. And thank you, Lord, that we can trust you with our lives and with these, our prayers, which we pray in the name and for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And amen. I carry on the tradition of wandering down this hall to the friendship room following a service to, well, grab a coffee. Looking forward to the day that you'll be able to join me. And uh, so we'll, we'll get back there. But in the meantime, let's uh, let the friendship room remind us to be connecting with one another and uh, maybe having a coffee or two along the way. So thanks for joining us for worship. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Mm -hmm.